uh, Christina Spicer, uh, who's going to give us a presentation on uh, the figure of the first Canadian Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald. So, Christina, uh, Christina will present her uh, paper called Set in Stone, Monuments, National Identity, and John A. Macdonald. Christina, the floor is yours. Um, so national symbols such as monuments represent a country's values in public spaces. For this reason, they've become a socio-political battleground. It is suggested that the power of national symbols is in their ability to enable unity and solidarity while allowing for a plurality of meanings. That is to say, they provide the idea of unity without actual hegemony. Monuments present layered meanings speaking to both the past and the present as memory systems transcribed in stone, civic comp compositions that teach us of our national heritage. They remain, a, they remind a nation of its collective history, act as a cultural expression of identity, and can be used as a tool to legitimize a state. Renan, how has been mentioned earlier, um, argued that misrepresenting history is actually essential in creating a nation. Due to its potential to be controversial, historical accuracy becomes a necessary casualty of compromise between different perspectives in the building of national identity. So this idea is summarized well by this quote. Um, he was actually the first in the US to teach sociology in the late 1800s. Um, but looking towards Canada, monuments have become a topic of contention in discussions of history, memory, identity, and power. The rise of multiculturalism and civic nationalism challenge monument symbolic identity. In recent years, the symbolism of monuments has been seriously questioned as racial tensions escalate, social inequalities accumulate, and states continue to struggle to define the nation. These stone figures, which seem powerless outside of their colonial ideologies, now have the ability to mobilize the nation in protest. Um, so this story actually begins on a little island on the west coast of Canada. Um, before moving to Scotland, where I am right now, um, I spent the previous 10 years living on Vancouver Island um, in the province of British Columbia. You can see that on the bottom left there. Um, on my way to work, I would pass a relatively moderately small statue of a man and honestly never thought much of it. Um, then in August of 2018 in the province's capital city of Victoria, um, a statue of Sir John A. Macdonald, Canada's first prime minister was temporarily removed from outside city hall as a gesture of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which was active from 2008 to 2015, was established for the purpose of documenting the history and lasting impacts of the Canadian Indian residential school system on Indigenous students and their families. The residential school network um, was a network of boarding schools for Indigenous peoples that were funded by the Canadian government. The system was created for the purpose of removing Indigenous children from the influence of their own culture and assimilating them into the dominant Canadian culture. So the TRC report um, affirmed that reconciliation must go beyond mutually respectful relationships. There is a moral responsibility to make amends for the past. So the Victoria City Council has been in conversation with the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations regarding what a suitable approach to reconciliation is. So following the statue's removal, the aspects of Canadian history that should be included within Canada's national identity has been the subject of national debate. Debates like these don't just constitute a referendum on national identity, but are a part of the process of defining and forming it. Its temporary removal sparked debates about the monument's meaning, the representation of Canadian history, and the pursuit of multiculturalism. Donald is remembered as one of Canada's founding fathers and one of the country's greatest leaders, serving as Canada's first prime minister, and he actually served as you can see there twice. 
Um, however, he's also remembered as a colonial tyrant and the architect of the Indian residential school system. So the McDonald statue embodies the tension between two competing perceptions of history. So the first illustrating McDonald as a founder of the nation and the second portraying him as a villain of the story of indigenous assimilation. So supporters of both versions of McDonald's legacy were present during the monument's removal. For some indigenous people, the monument is considered a painful reminder of colonial violence every time they enter city hall, while others wrapped themselves in provincial and Canadian flags and sang the, the national anthem during its removal. Um, and, and after <laughs> for a, a long time. Um, for the majority of non-Indigenous Canadians who are opposed to the monument's removal, McDonald activates an aspect of social memory that allows individuals to see themselves as a part of Canadian history. So fundamentally, the motivation beyond the monument's removal was reconciliation and working towards fulfilling the TRC's mandate of informing Canadians about the cultural genocide that occurred within the Indian residential schools. However, uh, the city's failure to recognize the monument's influence on collective memory and Canadian identity excludes many non-Indigenous Victorians, arguably creating a deeper divide within society. McDonald's removal may have furthered efforts of reconciliation between Indigenous people and the city, but it neglects a spirit of reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and the broader community. So there remains a lack of consensus across Canada regarding the best approach to reconciliation. A poll conducted in Manitoba, which is one of Canada's prairie provinces, found that only 38% of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Manitobans that were surveyed believed that the removal of statues commemorating the Canadian leaders that participated in establishing the residential school system should be considered a major aspect of reconciliation. Rather, the results suggested that government should focus on land claims and other structural sovereignty issues. The poll also asked Indigenous respondents of their thoughts on replacing the names of colonial figures in public spaces, um, such as the street names that you see on the left. Um, yet a majority expressed that an increased public education of the province history is of greater importance. Um, so you can see that there's a traditional um, acknowledgement there on the right um, that was said at the University where I did my undergrad um, before any big events or conferences or lectures. Um, so the acknowledgement that that's there on the right um, is meant to educate those present of the land's history. Also in some of the newer government offices that are um, downtown for the province, there is a written acknowledgement on the walls. Um, and before doing my, oops, uh, before doing my master's, I worked at one of those offices and um, it was so interesting actually being able to see the traditional acknowledgement of the land that we were working on and also include a map or interesting facts about um, Indigenous culture or history, which I found was so informative. So focusing or a focus on trans forming collective memory by working to inform Canadians while fostering healing may thus achieve the TRC's mandate more effectively than the materialistic removal of monuments. So by exclusively focusing on reconciliation, the truth aspect has been somewhat overlooked. Removing McDonald's statue does not bring the truth of Canadians' history to the forefront of public consciousness or correct the Canadian perspective of history. Instead, it could actually encourage a continued forgetting of the horrors that were committed against the Indigenous people. Using Halbach's th th theory that memory is socially constructed and acquired, the city is in a position to use the monument to reconstruct collective memory and subsequently 
the nation's identity. Removing the monument from the public sphere and controlling the depiction of history does not necessarily control public memory. Sir John A. Macdonald will continue to be remembered as a positive part of Canadian identity, whether or, whether or not his statue stands outside Victoria's City Hall. Furthermore, looking beyond the material removal of Macdonald's physical presence, the city's authority could be used this or could use this opportunity to reinvoke the public imagination and reconstruct memory to build a cohesive multicultural Canadian identity. Um, at the time of the monument's erection, a majority of Canadians honestly had no idea about Canada's past, and Canadian the Canadian government didn't offer a formal apology until 2008, um, to give you some perspective. The, as I mentioned earlier, the removal of the monument is temporary. So looking toward McDonald's future, what solutions are available? So there are two ways in which the city can follow um, what I call the Canadian model to foster reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians and cultivate an inclusive Canadian identity. So the first and most obvious one um, is to put them in a museum. Um, although some museums remain highly colonial, many museums take on the role of cultural mediator in multicultural environments and enact strict strategies of representation for marginalized and forgotten memories. Um, I've been to the Royal BC Museum multiple times um, and there's always a huge permanent um, Indigenous uh, exhibit which kind of changes between focusing on languages or history or um, cultures. So I think that they would do a good job of that. But alternatively, um, the second option is John could be returned to the social sphere but recontextualized through an addition of um, to his display. So placing an indigenous monument at McDonald's side to capture an alternative version of what ought to be remembered would provide context for his role in Canadian history, reflecting an inclusive multicultural identity. By ridding public spaces of problematic statues, society forecloses the discussion of their history, which are vital in the evolution of shared identity. A more inclusive process of reconciliation and reevaluation of the Canadian identity could be achieved through recontextualizing the monument to actually educate Victorians about the truth of Southern Canada. Although this juxtaposition between realities requires an acceptance that um, two different perspectives can occupy the same space, I believe that the fear of visual contradiction should not impede the depiction and discussion of the complex realities of multicultural post-colonial society. So the idea of contextualizing monuments um, is not mine um, and has been pursued by activist Dr. Blackstone, who's a Canadian born Kitsan activist um, who fought to have a plaque rewritten to recognize Nicholas Davin's role in what the TRC has called cultural genocide. Um, Davin was responsible for writing some reports which recommended residential schools to fix the Indian problem. Um, when the new plaque was unveiled, it was actually the third time um, that she had successfully pushed for um, grave site tributes at the Beechwood Cemetery to be either changed or recreated. She said that rewriting the plaques um, was about telling the full history to recognize the achievements of the historical figures, but also their darker roles in Canadian history. Um, I mentioned earlier that she's um, from the Kitsan, um, which is actually a nation in the West Coast in the province of British Columbia. Um, and that is a bit of a unique fact just because um, although they have Aboriginal title rights through the federal um, 1997 Dalamook decision, um, they're the treaty agreement between the Kitsan and the federal government and the provincial government of British Columbia has actually not been reached. Um, and some of the work that I've done for the provincial government, I've had the 
opportunity to have conversations with the hereditary chiefs of the Getsan. Um, I think that her being from that um, nation definitely adds a significant and unique um, dynamic to the work that she's doing. Um, so the addition of new monuments could facilitate an understanding of the country's past by offering a process for expanding and acknowledging the different identities that have helped form history and memory. Although the McDonald Monument no longer represents a singular version of the past, it remains a necessary point of communication and negotiation for groups within different um, groups with different memories of the same events. The bittersweet reality within post-colonial cultural, multicultural societies that there will always be very perspectives of history and memory competing for the re representation in the social sphere. So to conclude, um, removing the Sir John A. Macdonald monument has enraged the Canadian right wing, it's galvanized nationalist and has failed to contribute to reconciliation within the broader society in Victoria despite its intended purpose. Um, the people in Victoria, along with the rest of Canada, as argued by Charles Taylor, must work with each other to preserve these historical identities with their differences intact. The state will always maintain the dedicated places of memory as a part of the nation building. The city of Victoria should not subdue the complex realities by removing monuments, but rather highlight Canada's contentious past to build an effective multicultural society. Thanks. There we go. Thank you for that, Christina. Uh, there was already one question uh, asked in the chat. I'm just going to ask Alana, could you unmute and, and ask the question directly? Thank you. I really enjoyed it very much. Um, in South Africa, um, when people suggest that um, statues that are contentious should be moved to museums, the museums often object because they fear that if they have too many of those, state funding might dry, dry up. And our minister even said at one time, um, museums shouldn't become the dumping grounds of uh, offensive objects. Do the museums in Canada have a similar um, attitude when, when suggestions are made about the relocation of statues or monuments? Yeah, so I guess I would say that um, the, I don't think that the first thing that they like to do is to put them in a museum. Um, I think generally when the monument or the statue or the person who that monument is, is of, um, is of some type of importance, um, the Canadian government feels like they just can't get rid of it. So they just really don't know where to put it. Um, I would say there are museums though, uh, especially in, in Ontario, that um, I think build certain displays around monuments. So it's not like a dumping ground. They'll actually, um, they'll find indigenous art or artifacts and then they might take a, a painting um, of a, look like a white colonial and actually build a whole exhibit um, around both of those things and, and actually tell the full story. Um, so I think in my opinion, um, when it is done, it, it isn't just, we don't know where to put this, so let's just dump it in here and put a small sign and, and, and be, be done with it. Um, it's generally a very deliberate and long process of making sure that um, whatever uh, is, being dumped in a museum is actually being thought about and, and contextualized. Um, but again, I think one of the big differences, if it's um, an, an example of, of, of good old John, um, I feel like the amount of people that would see that wonderful exhibit might be quite limited um, compared to if thus, if a similar contextualized exhibit was in the spot that he was to begin with. Um, so, thank you. Uh, there's another question, uh, Fabiola, if you want to uh, get the floor. It's all yours. Hello. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I actually posted my question already. The concept of reconciliation in South America, and, well, in Latin America, 
is quite questioned actually and controversial. And I was wondering how, how does it work in the north of the continent and who is driving these discourses and who wants to reconcile with whom? Um, just curious. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so I would say reconciliation is in the forefront of a lot of things that is, is done. Um, if it's done well or not, I think definitely varies um, quite a lot. Uh, not, not to point fingers or name names, but um, the Ontario government offered to buy the Sir Darnay MacDonald off of the British Columbia government to put it up um, in, in their province. Um, so definitely it differs, but I would say the federal government and all provincial governments um, work hard to make sure that the recommendations that come out of the TRC are actually implemented. And then I think that does filter down. So I actually attended um, a session hosted by the city that was over multiple days, but one of those was actually dedicated to what to do with the statue. Um, so it, I, I think that it kind of works on all levels and it kind of does have to uh, filter down to cities and actual spots because the federal government just saying reconcile um, isn't going to really do much. Um, but I think that there has been quite a big focus on, you, you kind of asked who's who's reconciling with with, with who. Um, I, I would say because it's being pushed by government, it ends up being the government and the indigenous population. And I think that what I try to kind of point to is um, the actual people um, the who are not indigenous also have to be a part of that as well. Um, so I think that's, that there could be ways to kind of bring in non-Indigenous into that conversation. Um, taking down a statue it looks great on the city, but uh, the people that were there that were non-Indigenous had no idea why it was being taken down. They said, he's, he's the guy who founded Canada and they were freaking out. And fair enough, because they, they didn't understand what was happening. Um, so I think that, that that conversation needs to be between everyone. Um, not just government and them. Um, and again, just to kind of jump in on one, one last thing, we always talk about reconciliation, but we never really speak about the truth aspect. Um, we, the, we, I think that is such a big buzz word and um, being in government back in Canada is such a big thing. And we have a different um, government areas that focus on that, but we can't really reconcile the truth aspect that doesn't come first um, and even though the TRC did a, a quite good job of gathering that info the general population still doesn't understand um, and it's only uh, an education curriculum explaining what actually happened in settler Canada has only been incorporated in the last like year or two so even when I was in um, LM elementary school. We had no idea. It was never, ever taught. So I think that Canada's all often seen as so progressive um, in so many ways, and, and we are, but the the truth of settler Canada is really not common knowledge. And I think that things like the education has to change first. That way, when the statue is taken down, you don't have um, what people would say is radicals waving Canadian flags, but it's just that they just don't don't understand. So I think that in many ways, Canada's kind of jumped the gun on the, the reconciliation bit because it looks better um, and kind of, kind of missed the, the first the bit of the TRC. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Christina. Thanks for the question.